Hello, this is Graham Newbig, and welcome back to CS11747, Neural Networks for NLP. And this time we're going to be talking about condition generation. So language models are generative models of text, which means that they can create text. So we essentially use them to model a probability distribution over plausible sentences or documents or whatever in a particular language. And from this, you know, we can randomly sample some output and get the Malfoys said Hermione. Harry was watching him. He looked like Madame Maxime, etc., etc., etc. So this was a language model that perhaps obviously, if you've read the series, was trained on Harry Potter books. And we can create very large language models that can generate very plausible text uh, like GPT-2, GPT-3, uh, Turing NLM, uh, Turing NLG, etc., etc. However, m perhaps more interesting are conditioned language models. And conditioned language models are essentially not just generating text randomly, but generating text according to some specification. And so we have our input X and we have our output Y, where the output Y is text. And then we use these to generate outputs. So for example, the input X could be some sort of structured data. Uh, the output could be a natural language description. We could have the input be one language like English, the output be another language like Japanese. Could have the input be a document and the output be a short description input be utterance, response, image, text, speech, transcript, etc., etc. So here you will notice that all of the inputs are of various varieties, uh, whereas the output are normally are text. So these all correspond to important and widely used uh, NLP technologies. So for example, structured data to NL description is very often called natural language generation or data to text generation. We have machine translation, summarization, response generation, image captioning, speech recognition, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. So this is a very broadly applicable variety of technology. And first, I'd like to jump into the formulation and modeling. So basically, what we've covered already in language modeling is calculating the probability of a sentence. So we specifically do this by calculating the probability of the sentence big X by decomposing the probability into the probability of the next word given the context or all of the previous words and multiplying all of these probabilities together. So what conditional language models do is instead of just calculating the probability of X itself, they calculate the probability of Y given X. So they're conditioning the probability of Y on X. And the way we compose this is we do basically the same thing we were doing for X, calculating the probability of the next word in Y. But in addition to all the previous words in Y, we also have this additional context here. So, as I said before, this additional context can take many, many different forms. So, we can talk about one type of language model, uh, which would be the RNN-based language model that we covered in the previous class. And this language model, essentially what it does is it feeds in the beginning of sentence symbol, predicts the first word, for example, I, then it feeds in the next word, and predict, uh, the, the word it just predicted, like I, and it predicts the next word, like hate, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. And what you can see from this LSTM language model is essentially that every single time it makes a prediction, it has access to all of the previous words through its LSTM state, which is kind of a good implementation of this calculating the probability of a sentence. So what would this look like in a conditional language model? So the simplest way we could implement something like this uh, looks a little bit like this. So we essentially have an RNN or two RNNs where we basically 
feed in the input and for example, in this case, the input is a Japanese sentence. We encode it all into a hidden state. So now we have information about the hidden state. And then we feed this into a decoder where the decoder is essentially a language model, just like the one that I talked about. And so what you can see is now we're doing exactly what we promised before. We're conditioning on the added context X as we predict the next word, because we have access to it through this encoder. So this is called an encoder-decoder model. And this variety of encoder-decoder model, not this particular architecture, now uh, powers a very large number of applications that we use in uh, you know, all of NLP, basically. So, there are a few details about how to do this. Um, you can uh, do what I said before, where you essentially initialize the hidden state of the decoder um, with the, uh, that of the encoder. You can also take the hidden state of the encoder and transform it into some uh, particular shape and pass that onto the decoder or input it at every time step. So essentially, you pass in the hidden state of the encoder to the decoder at every time step. So the details of this, while important on individual applications, are probably less important than the overall concept, which is that you have an encoder that calculates a hidden state and passes it on to the decoder, which then predicts the probability of the output. Okay. So I talked about modeling and how we can calculate the conditional, learn the conditional probability of the output given the input. And one thing you will notice is that this is extremely simple, the modeling change that I made here. And we're gonna talk about more complicated models going forward, but nonetheless, I think this demonstrates the power of neural networks that we can essentially take these very simple modeling components that you've only learned in the first five classes of a semester long course and build a model that at least theoretically could handle more or less the most important tasks in NLP. So, however, I have left one thing off so far, which is once we've created a model to calculate these probabilities, how do we actually generate the output? And that's what I'll get to next. So the generation problem, as I said before, is that we have a model of P of Y given X. How do we use it to generate a sentence? And there are essentially two methods. The first one is sampling, where we try to generate a random sentence according to the probability distribution. And another one is argmax, where we try to generate the sentence with the highest probability. So we have a whole class on methods to solve this generation problem later. So I'm just going to kind of go over the very simplest ones that you would need to know to get started. And we'll cover this in more detail later. So with respect to sampling, why would we want to do sampling of a random sentence in the first place? So the basic idea is that we would like to know what the model thinks is a plausible sentence in the output. And another reason why we might want to do something like this is let's say we want a system where the output is not deterministic every single time and we actually want to sample different outputs. And this might be useful in, for example, a dialogue system where it's talking with the same user over and over again and we don't always want it to say the same thing. So essentially what this method can do is randomly generate words one by one, uh, or this ancestral sampling method. And so the way it works essentially is while we have not sampled the end of sentence symbol, we simply sample a, the next word according to the probability calculated by the model. And one important thing to know here is that if our goal is to sample an output from this model. And this is an exact method for sampling from P of uh, X. That's actually a typo, it should be P of Y given X. But um, this is an exact method for sampling 
appropriately according to this probability distribution. And this is important because you know that you'd never need another different sampling algorithm if you want to do what I just said, which is sample from the model's probability distribution. Now, the question of argmax search, where we calculate the output with the highest probability is much harder. And in fact, there's provably no way that we can actually calculate this uh, efficiently or uh, in a non-NP hard manner uh, without um, some sort of approximation to the model. So it's not possible in standard encoder decoder models in polynomial time. So, however, we would like to do this in a lot of situations. Like let's say we have a machine translation system. The machine translation system, it would usually be a good idea to generate the best scoring output because that's the one that's most likely to be correct and the one you probably want to be showing to your users. So greedy search is a very simple method to do this and it's basically analogous to the sampling algorithm that I just talked about. And the way it works is while we have not selected the end of sentence symbol, we select the next word to maximize the probability of the following word. So instead of sampling according to the probability distribution, we just pick the highest scoring one. So this is very simple, um, but it's not an exact method for search and it has very real problems. So it will often generate the easy words first. So if we have at any point in time, we have like a high frequency word and a low frequency word, it will tend to generate the easy words first. And it will also prefer generating multiple common words to generating one rare word. So essentially, you should be careful when you use a simple method like this because it will mess up a lot of the time. In addition, um, another option is something called beam search. And beam search essentially, instead of picking one high probability word, it maintains several paths. So this is an example where at each time step, we main two, maintain two steps through the graph or two paths through the graph. So in time step one, we select either A or B. Time step two, we have either A, B or B, B, which are the highest scoring paths uh, still on the beam at each time step. So this is similar to greedy search, except instead of using only a single output, we use many outputs. And this is kind of the industry standard for performing search in neural models nowadays. And yeah, anyway, as I said before, we'll be covering more of this in a future class. So these are kind of the important algorithms that you'll need to know. So we have an example of this in the code examples, so please feel free to take a look of it, at it if you're interested. Okay, and one other thing that I'd like to talk about, this is not directly only applicable to sequence sequence models, but it's a very important trick that often gets you large gains in accuracy so I wanted to talk about this sooner rather than later, so I put it in this class. And it is also very useful for sequence sequence models. Um, and I am calling conditional generation models sequence sequence models. Uh, sorry, I realized I changed my terminology, but basically a sequence sequence model is a conditioned generation model where the input is a sequence. Okay, so Model ensembling, what is model ensembling? Essentially, it's combining predictions from multiple models. And the basic idea is we have model one on the left side, we have model two on the right side, and each one of them kind of independently makes predictions. And then these two predictions are combined together to make the final prediction of the model ensemble itself. So why would we want to do something like this? Basically, the idea is that these two models are 
either trained independently with different random seeds or trained with different data sets or trained with different model architectures or something like this. So the two underlying models are, are different in some way. And if we have models that are different in some way, they often make uncorrelated errors. In addition, models tend to be more uncertain when they're about to make errors. So models tend to be more uncertain about their errors than they tend to be about true uh, correct answers. So because of this, this allows, makes it possible to smooth over the idiosyncrasies of any individual models. So when one model errs, if the other model is correct, this will tend to improve accuracy overall. So the easiest way to do this is through linear interpolation. And the way linear interpolation works is it takes a weighted average of m model probabilities. So like, let's say we want to predict the next item here, the next word in the sentence with an ensemble. We will essentially have the model itself and then the probability of using that model at that time step. And very often in neural models, we take the second probability and just set it to the uniform distribution, uh, one divided by m. And that means that we essentially take the average of the probabilities of each time. The second option is log linear combination of model probabilities. And the way it works is essentially we do the same thing except instead of taking the average over probabilities, we take the average over log probabilities like this. And then we have some coefficient here to essentially measure the weight of each model. Unlike the previous time uh, with linear interpolation where essentially we were just uh, multiplying together the probabilities, in this log linear interpolation case, the linear interpolation of multiple log probabilities is not a well-formed log probability. In other words, if you uh, exponentiated it and summed all of them together, you would not get a value of one. So essentially, after you have done this, you need to take a softmax to renormalize it and make sure that it is uh, a well-formed probability. Yes, and that's interpolation coefficient in the log probability. And the interpolation coefficient, again, is also set to the uniform distribution, although it doesn't necessarily have to be. So given this, which one would you use? Would you use linear or log linear? And one way you can think about this is think of it in logic. So a linear is a logical or. Um, what this means is or a soft logical or essentially. What this means is that interpolated model will like any choice that a, any model in the ensemble gives a high probability. And this is good to use with models so that capture different traits. So for example, let's say you have a model that looks up um, things in a database and then you have another neural model the model that looks up things in a database might give a good probability in some instances, but give zero probability to the correct answer in other instances. So if you use something like this, it would be a good idea to use linear interpolation. And it's particularly necessary when any model can assign zero probability because the log probability of this model would be a negative infinity and log linear interpolation would basically become numerically not well defined. Log linear is like logical and, and the interpolated model only likes choices or mainly likes choices where all the models agree that it's a good choice. And this is good when you want to restrict possible answers. So for example, um, if you have a particular model that can rule out particularly egregiously bad hypotheses, like hypotheses that are offensive or something like this, you would probably want to use that within a log linear model so it could filter out the, uh, the bad things. And then finally, as a method for ensembling, um, 
that is efficient, um, there is something called parameter averaging. So basically the problem with ensembling is that it means we have to use M models at test time, increasing our time and memory complexity. And what parameter averaging does is it basically gets a cheap version of ensembling that still gives some of the good effects. And basically what you do is you write out models several times near the end of training and take the average of their parameters. So you would write out maybe 10 models or something like that, or five models, take the average of their parameters and use this model in prediction. So the good thing about this is, number one, you only need to train a model once. So you use a single training run and you use the final parameter values. A second good thing about it is that it generates a single model at test time. And because it generates a single model at test time, it's more efficient to run at test time also. So it would be good for production systems, for example. So another way to combine together multiple models is ensemble distillation. And one problem with parameter averaging is it only works for models within the same run. And the reason for this is relatively intuitive. Each of the feature values within a neural network doesn't have any inherent meaning in its index per se. So for example, the first feature in your matrix could very well be the third feature in your uh, matrix, but these features just happen to be that way because you initialize the parameters randomly. So, you know, the first feature in a word embedding could stand for animacy and the third could stand for negation uh, or vice versa, depending on your initial random initialization. So if you average together all the parameters, you just kind of get a soup of parameters and your model wouldn't work at all. So another way that we can take a ensemble, which can be slow because we have to run all the models at the same time, and turn it into a single model that can be run efficiently at test time is something called ensemble distillation. And ensemble distillation is a variety of tech, uh, a broader technique called knowledge distillation, which trains another model to copy a larger or more powerful model. So when you're doing this for ensemble distillation, you would do something to copy the ensemble. So the way this works is you train the model to essentially match the distribution of the, uh, sorry, this his written description, but it should be distribution, match the distribution over the predicted words. So essentially what this means is if you train an ensemble, you use it to make predictions over lots of data, and then the ensemble predicts the next word is cat with a probability of 0 0.7, feline with a probability of 0 0.2, and dog with a probability of 0 0.1 you train the smaller model to actually match these predictions instead of matching the ground truth. And there's a couple reasons why you would want to do this. One reason is that this would train the model to essentially be confident in the same places where the ensemble is and be less confident in the same places where the ensemble is. And this can be useful. Um, it uh, essentially also has an effect of smoothing over noisy data. So if your underlying data is noisy, the ensemble also, uh, its predictions might even be better than the original data that you're training on. So th this has proven to be a pretty effective method. And there's a bunch of uh, kind of examples of this within the Kim et al. 2016 paper, and it's written very well, so you can take a look at it if you're interested in learning more. This has been shown to increase accuracy, notably over just training the model uh, from scratch. Another technique to be familiar with is stacking. And so what if we have two very different models where predictions of outputs are done in very different ways? Uh, so one example of this is you have kind of a phrase-based translation model and a neural uh, translation model. So the phrase-based model uh, is a non-neural model and it cannot easily be ensembled together with a neural model. Uh, 
But what you can do is take the output of the phrase space model and feed it as input to a neural MT model. And recently, we've also uh, done some work where you take an extractive summarization system and feed in to an abstractive summarization which system, which is in a similar vein. And the reason why this can be useful is you can take models that have certain strengths, like for example, a phrase-based translation model is very good at memorizing multi-word phrases, which neural models can uh, be not good at sometimes, and use that strength while still using the strength of the downstream neural model. So uh, that might be in generating fluent text or doing word reordering properly, et cetera, et cetera. Okay, so now I've talked about methodology and I'd like to talk just a few case studies in conditional language modeling. So as I mentioned at the beginning, this is a very broad technique that can be applied to many different directions. So one example, other than machine translation and summarization, which I've been talking about uh, somewhat frequently, you can do generation from structured data and when you say natural language generation to an old school uh, natural language processing person, it generally means this. So this could be, for example, in a dialogue system, uh, you have a certain intent that you would like to express and you take in the intent in a structured format like this uh, table here and then generate a sentence that corresponds to that intent. And this can be used uh, in a broad variety of things. It's actually used pretty widely now in, for example, generating websites, uh, weather reports, uh, et cetera, et cetera. This is still a difficult problem for data-driven methods. So, for example, if we have this structured data on the left, uh, this structured data happens to be a basketball box score. So it has a score of the game it has uh, which players scored, how many points, et cetera, et cetera. And we have the thing on the right. And what we can see is if we just feed this into a neural model, well, what happens is it generates an output where a pretty large portion of the information is actually factually incorrect. So for example, the score of the, um, uh, the score or the record of the teams is incorrect, et cetera, et cetera. So this is also interesting from a evaluation perspective because how do we evaluate this factuality is the first step to fixing it. And uh, there's been some work in this area as well. Another thing that you can do is uh, generating from both in input and certain control labels. So this is one example of it, uh, where we feed in a word and some labels about what uh, the word should look like on the output, and it can automatically generate morphological inflections uh, of a particular word. But it can also be used for many other examples. So for example, in translation, you could try to generate outputs of different levels of politeness or different topical appropriateness or something like this. And the easiest way to do this is to just append a label to the beginning of your input and train a model. So if you uh, have a bunch of inputs in your training data that you know are polite on the output side, a bunch that you know are less polite on the output side, you could append a polite label and an impolite label and uh, the polite label would learn to generate polite output, the impolite label would learn to generate impolite output, et cetera, et cetera. And then you could append the label that you want at test time. So if you only want polite translations at test time, you would uh, add the politeness label. Another thing you could do is from speaker or document traits. So here's an example uh, where you take a TED Talk description and generate a TED Talk. And they encode the description in keywords in an author embedding. And the author embedding tells you essentially characteristics of the author, what kind of person they are, etc. The keywords tell you what the content is on a high level. Um, 
And there's different ways to incorporate this into the model. These are maybe a little bit uh, less important themselves, but the idea of personalizing a model is uh, also interesting, and there's been some follow-up work on this as well. Another thing is uh, from lists of traits or lists of things that you would like to have mentioned in a particular uh, output. So for an example, uh, this is a very interesting paper where they take a name of a recipe and ingredients of the recipe and try to generate a recipe. And they propose a model called the neural checklist model uh, that tells when a particular item in the list has been generated. And Essentially, uh, if you have all of these ingredients, it keeps track of how many times it has used this ingredient in generation and tries to cover the entire uh, tries to cover the entire input. And uh, also from images. So if you uh, want to take in an image and generate an output from this. Uh, then you could use this for describing uh, images to uh, generate alt text or help people who are having trouble seeing uh, in the uh, understanding the world. And this uses standard image encoders uh, to generate the uh, features of the image and then can uh, use an RNN or, or whatever other sequence modeling model to generate the output. And now there's also a lot of other things like uh, visual storytelling where uh, you try to generate a story based on a sequence of images or video captioning, etc. So lots of work on multimodal space as well. And another example is uh, generating from embeddings. So uh, you have a word embedding and you feed in a, uh, this word embedding and generate a definition of the word. And I found this kind of interesting. It's kind of trying to extract or explain the knowledge that we have encoded in a word embedding. Um, and this, you know, um, is an interesting approach. Uh, in reality, it doesn't work that well, but the fact that it doesn't work that well is kind of indicative that the word embeddings themselves kind of have insufficient information to fully understand the definition of the word, which I think is an interesting finding in itself. And uh, this particular paper proposes a few tricks on top of a standard sequence sequence model uh, to handle uh, affixes and hypernyms of the words uh, to improve this performance. So a final very important question is, now that we have these models, how do we evaluate them? How do we tell we're doing a good job of generation? And the basic evaluation paradigm that we use is we train up our model on a training set. We then have a test set, uh, usually containing parallel input-output pairs. So if it's translation, it would be a input in one language, output in another language. Uh, summarization, it would be a document and then a shorter text. Um, image captioning, images and uh, descriptions. We use a system to generate uh, outputs. I wrote translations here, but it could be any kind of output. And we compare the target outputs with a reference. Um, and uh, this is the standard paradigm for automatic evaluation. Actually, uh, perhaps a more preferable thing is to do uh, human evaluation. And in human evaluation, basically what we do is we take an input and we generate outputs, and then we ask a human to actually evaluate the quality of the outputs along different axes. And which axes you evaluate the um, outputs along is kind of dependent on the task that you're doing. For translation, it, you might evaluate along adequacy, which is how well the output reflects the content, fluency, which is how fluent the content is, how, how smooth, or rank-based evaluation, where you say which one is better. Um, and this is kind of the final goal. It's often the gold standard. 
of evaluation, but it's also slow and expensive because you have to hire people to do it. And it's actually surprisingly difficult to get qualified human raters to do something like this. So you can't just easily throw things at Mechanical Turk without lots of quality control. You need to be careful that the humans are not overfitting to the output uh, reference as opposed to kind of actually evaluating along the traits that you want them to evaluate according to. So this is actually surprisingly hard, but in the end, uh, I think it's worth remembering that this is what we want to be doing. And it's always an option. It's not that expensive uh, if you want to try it, especially if you uh, convince uh, your, your friends to help out. So I'm, I'm happy to talk more about this for people who are interested in the class. So um, one interesting thing, if you're interested in working on particular tasks, is recently there's human evaluation shared tasks. Uh, so for example, for machine translation, the very famous one is the Conference on Machine Translation, which is held every year. And they run a relatively large scale human evaluation. They have built up lots and lots of methodology about how to do human evaluation well. So if you're interested in human evaluation, you uh, can see, uh, read the WMT reports and see how they do it because they do a very good job of it, uh, including you know, how to do quality control, how to do statistical testing and uh, other things like this. There's also a recently released composite leaderboard uh, called the Genie leaderboard, which covers QA summarization in MT. Uh, this is a very recent thing, but basically what you do is if you generate uh, results for a, a variety of conditional language modeling tasks and you can submit it there and they'll automatically uh, run Mechanical Turk on some of the more uh, like high scoring outputs. So that's another thing to think about if you're interested in generation. So there is uh, this. Um, uh, human evaluation, but in addition, automatic evaluation, uh, essentially what it does is it looks at your output and it tries to compare it with the reference. Uh, the most famous version of this is blue, and the details of blue are kind of not quite as important. It's the basic idea that it is trying to compare the output directly to the reference according to exact string match of n-grams. So for example, if we have uh, Taro visited um, and Taro visited here, this would be a unigram match for each of the individual words and a bigram match for each of the, uh, for the bigram itself. And you match up to four grams usually, and also you have a penalty if you generate outputs that are too short. And this is very, very widely used. It's still kind of the standard in machine translation, despite being quite old now. And uh, the reason why is it's very easy to use and it can be used for measuring improvement within individual very similar systems. Um, but the difficulty is it has lots of obvious problems. Like for example, it can't identify paraphrases easily. So if you have uh, paraphrase content, it will fail on that. Um, it's also notably bad for comparing very different systems. So if you have a uh, two systems that were made by different organizations using very different methodology, for example, it can fail uh, in these cases. Also in recent years, there has been a slew of embedding based metrics proposed. And these metrics are nice because they take care of a few issues of um, blue and other uh, metrics, for example. And for example, they are better at handling paraphrases because they do matching in embedding space. And also they can be directly trained to predict human evaluation metrics that you're interested in. So one example of this is BERT score. And the way BERT score works is essentially it finds similarity between BERT embeddings uh, using a variety of algorithms. Notably, this is an unsupervised metric that doesn't use any human evaluation data for training. Bluert is another method, and essentially what this does is this trains BERT 
to predict human evaluation scores. So you have a whole bunch of human evaluation scores and you train a model, neural model. I, I'm writing BERT here. I assume some, many people have heard of BERT, but uh, we'll be covering it more in a following class. But anyway, you train this neural model to predict human evaluation scores, and they also have some nice clever tricks, like where you first train the model to predict automatic evaluation scores, and then fine tune it on predicting human evaluation scores, which ends up being very important for generalization. Another thing um, that is important is all of the metrics that I've talked about so far are reference-based metrics. So in other words, they use a human output to help you evaluate. How, this can be a problem though, if for example, your human outputs themselves are not very good. Uh, so Comet is an alternative that essentially trains the model to predict human eval somewhat like Bluert, but it also looks at the source sentence. And this is good because now your model can also confirm, you know, for example, whether all the uh, content is included in the source sentence. And there's also other things like PRISM, and this is a model based on training a paraphrasing model and identifying whether there's a paraphrase between the reference. Another method that you can use, which I think is under appreciated but still very uh, reasonable is perplexity, which is calculating the perplexity, conditional perplexity of words in the held out set without doing any generation. So this shouldn't, um, this shouldn't be your only evaluation metric. And the reason why is it doesn't consider generating output. So like, let's say you had a bug in your output generation algorithm or something like this. Um, you wouldn't be able to detect it with perplexity. However, um, one issue that reference-based metrics have is like if the reference is poor, for example, and this model is able to handle this because it's able to generate both good references and poor references or kind of like stilted references. And so perplexity kind of handles this issue of having the references not be appropriate or not being able to handle paraphrases. So I think this is particularly good for problems with lots of ambiguity, for example, dialogue. And there indeed are recent works that show that the perplexity of a dialogue system is actually reasonably well correlated with how well it does uh, according to human evaluation of dialogue tasks. Um, so which one should you use? And that's a good question. Um, I've noted a lot of pros and cons, and there's many, many other metrics. I've only touched, you know, five or six, but there's hundreds that you could be using. And the way we can choose which one to use is to use meta-evaluation. And meta-evaluation essentially runs human evaluation and automatic evaluation on the same outputs and calculates uh, correlation between them. So uh, you do human eval and then automatic eval on similar outputs and then calculate something like a rank correlation coefficient like Kendall's tau. Uh, and this tells you um, how well your metric is doing. If it has high correlation with human eval, that's good. If it has low correlation, that's not good. There's a couple examples of this, like the WMT metrics tasks. So again, uh, WMT is ahead of the curve here with respect to evaluation. They're, they run this every year to try to make sure our evaluation metrics are still uh, doing well with recent systems. And also we've recently released a data set real sum that allows you to do evaluation on recent summarization systems. One thing to note is that evaluation itself is very, very hard. And in fact, I'd say at this point, it's almost as hard as building systems themselves, uh, yet understudied. And um, for example, in the WMT 2019 tasks, I believe, most metrics had no correlation with human eval over the best systems, uh, which means that really evaluation is almost becoming the bottleneck in uh, many of these tasks. So that is all. Um, I'm happy to take questions in the class for people who are in the class. And uh, for the discussion question, I would like to have people take a look at some evaluation results uh, for machine translation, where we have good 
results and poor results and um, see how well human evaluation correlates with automatic evaluation. So um, looking forward to the discussion then and uh